It's hard for us, I think, as people, to think that we have enough. Especially when everything around us is constantly showing us how much more that we could have. Advertising, I think, has become one of the great American art forms. Everything we see and hear in the public square comes with a commercial attached to it. How to improve your appearance. How to grow your desirability. Your financial security. Your social status. Your career productivity. Buy this and be confident. Get this and be relaxed. Try this and be safe. Be entertained. Be carefree. And no matter how much time we take to do it, or how much money we spend to get there, we can never quite nail the contentment thing, can we? This brings to mind, I think, the story of Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus' story. Zacchaeus is a man who was haunted by everything he couldn't have, which explains his line of work. Kent Hughes rightly describes Zacchaeus as the miserly little kingpin of the Jericho tax franchise. And we read his story in the Gospel according to Luke, a Gospel that hammers Jesus' words about wealth home to us over and over and over again, no matter how desperately we try to look away when Jesus starts talking about our money, our savings, our bank accounts. Zacchaeus, to remind you, was a Jewish man and also a chief tax collector for the Roman IRS. So as you can imagine, he was not the most popular guy in town. In fact, he was probably the most hated man in all of Jericho. He was not only a crook who taxed too heavily on, on poor people who could barely make ends meet, but he was a traitor to his own, his own people group by being Rome's lackey. But something entirely surprising and unlikely happens when Zacchaeus meets Jesus. He has utterly and entirely and irreversibly changed. The whole town nearly faints, I'm sure, when they hear Zacchaeus joyfully declare, look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor Lord. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. We read that in Luke 19, verse 8. Now think about this. This is Zacchaeus we're talking about. This miserly little uh, kingpin. (laughs) Kent Hughes calls him. And when he comes to know Jesus, this is what he says. He starts by giving half of his wealth to the poor. And the other half, He says he'll make four times restitution of what he extorted from them in the first place. Now that's a remarkable action. And I think it's even more remarkable that this comes on the tale of Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18, just the chapter before. See, Zacchaeus was living out the command that caused that rich young ruler to walk away when Jesus looked at him and said, sell all you have, and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. What caused him to walk away from the faith is how Zacchaeus showed that he was of the faith. And just like that, this wee little man became larger than life. Hugh says he went to Jesus mastered by his passion for getting, and he left Jesus mastered by his passion, his newfound passion of giving. He went in to talk with Jesus as the littlest man in Jericho, and he left being the biggest man in town. What Zacchaeus was doing on the outside proved that something had happened to him on the inside. That's why Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. This house that everybody in this city hates. Because He too, not by ethnicity, not by um, religion, but He too, by faith in God, is a son of Abraham. 
And Jesus reminds them all of what they're maybe too scandalized to remember. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. Even criminals like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus got saved and his new heart and generous action was evidence. Money no longer mattered to him. Jesus and other people did. Now, why do I bring all of this up? We're not in the Gospel of Luke this morning. We're in the book of Philippians. Well, this is a story that no doubt I think would have been very familiar to Paul. Remember, one of his missionary companions on his many journeys was Dr. Luke, who was uh, his missionary partner and who is the only Gospel writer that writes about this account. So no doubt, Paul and Luke, as they would talk about what they'd seen Jesus do, how they'd seen the power of His Spirit go out in the world, Luke would have told this story to Paul, no doubt, several times. And so I think Paul may even have something like this in the back of his mind as he writes to this world-weary church in Macedonia, the Philippians. Remember, they are a church that have indeed chosen to give up everything that makes them feel safe in this life. They've chosen to give up their worldly status and comfort for the sake of Jesus and His Gospel. And after all, Paul, who writes to several other churches besides the Philippians, when he writes to the Corinthians in his second letter, Paul writes and mentions implicitly the church in Philippi. He says to this, remember the Corinthians are divided, have all sorts of scandals, they're taking each other to court, they're getting into affairs with mothers-in-law and sons-in-law. It's just it's a messy church. And to that church, Paul writes and says, we want you to know, brothers and sisters of Corinth, about the grace of God that was given to the churches in Macedonia. One of those churches being the church of Philippi. During a severe trial brought about by affliction, their abundant joy and extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. When they had nothing, they were all the more generous. And I can testify that according to their ability and even beyond their human ability, of their own accord, not under duress, not under peer pressure, they begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry to the saints. Meaning, giving resources to other struggling churches. When they didn't have, when they were the ones that needed resources, when they didn't have anything. And they did this not just as we had hoped, Paul says. Instead, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by God's will. That's the people that Paul is writing to right now who are discouraged in their faith. That's what they're capable of. So using the Philippians as an example to others, this is what Paul says to the Corinthians, and I, dare I say, even our church this morning. In 2 Corinthians 8, 7-9, through he says this, Now as you excel in everything, in faith, speech, knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, those are good things. They believe in Jesus. They speak well of the Lord. They're knowledgeable about theology. They're diligent and loving their missionaries and pastors and teachers. But Paul says, don't just stop there. Excel also in this act of grace. And the grace of giving generously. Even when you don't feel like you have much to give. He says, I'm not saying this is a command. Paul is not twisting anybody's arms here. He says, rather, by means of the diligence of others, I am testing the genuineness of your faith. See, Paul understands that to have a real, authentic, Christian faith in Jesus is not just about big talk or coming from a family that's always gone to this church or anything else. If you don't live out your faith in Christ with obedience, with love, with generosity, with compassion, well then, Paul says that that is maybe a faith that needs a little testing. A faith that needs some proving. And so, 
we see in the Philippians, and we see in Paul this morning, we see the kind of heart that has gone from greed to the utmost gratitude. And so the question for us, as we look at Paul, as we look at the Philippians, is how do we get to where they are ourselves? How do we go from the constant agitation we feel as Americans where we always feel like we have to buy more and do more and we compete with our neighbors and coworkers and family members? Oh, they just got the newest this thing. Or, oh man, have you seen their house? They're putting a, a nice patio on the back. When we're constantly feeling the pressure to, to, to hoard more, to give ourselves more, how do we get to a place where we're like this? Even when we have so little to give, The Apostle could say of us, they still give a wealth away generously. And so, I think for us, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the secret of being that kind of content? That's what Paul says this morning. What's the secret of being content? Now, in verse 10, and with some of these thoughts that we've just talked about in mind, Paul says this, He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly because once again, you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, so concerned about me, but you lacked an opportunity to show it. So, here's a scenario. When Paul was all alone in his Roman prison cell, what a welcome sight it was for him to see that walking through that dark doorway was Epaphroditus from the Philippian congregation. And not only was it Epaphroditus to come to check in on Paul and fellowship with him and and stay with him, but he brought a love offering from the Philippians. So it's not lost on Paul, in other words, that for this church, it's not out of sight, out of mind. So for for so many churches, when, uh, when you're not able to see the people that you're supporting, It's easy to not remember them in prayer and giving, but that's not the case for the Philippians. They are straining. They're they're beating their brains trying to think, how can we be a blessing to Paul? That's how generous they are. Even when they don't know or don't seem to have an opportunity, they're just waiting for the moment. Not that they can take, but they can give. Now, prisoners of Rome in Paul's day relied exclusively on support of outsiders for their food and clothing and health care. There was no state-mandated funds for this. So what a relief it was for Paul, who had nothing, and who the Roman praetorium gave nothing. As their church planter, they remembered him, and he was able to, from them, receive these generous and costly gifts so that even behind bars, Paul could continue his ministry, his ministry of writing and encouraging other churches, of even evangelizing his own captors. But I think even more than Paul feeling blessed that when he's in prison, he gets a care package, that he gets a little bit of money, he gets things so he can spend on his own physical needs. Even more than that, Paul is thrilled that these people Sending him these kind of funds, these kinds of gifts, means that on the inside, they have been transformed. They're not who they once were. They're something entirely new in God. They're no longer people that live to hoard for themselves. Romans were all about collecting social status and capital. They're just like us pagan Americans today who want to just build up our little empires and portfolios and lord this over people. That's the natural human instinct to just to, to bring in stuff and to sit on all of it and to not share and to, to enrich ourselves. But they are different because they are handing out to Paul, even self-sacrificially, and they're, they're handing out their resources to anybody in their spiritual community in need, even when they're struggling to get by themselves. See, generosity and Christians leads others to worship Christ. And we can see that because Paul himself, when he receives their gifts, rejoices in the Lord, he says. Now I wonder in this nation where there's so little worship of the Lord, 
If that is not a rebuke on us churches and on us Christians that we are not generous with our time and energy and love and compassion and resources. They don't look at churches. People on the outside don't look at churches and say, look how much they give freely. Look how joyfully they do it. You know what they see instead? They look at us and say, look at these people that are constantly in a civil war with one another, that gossip about each other, that fight to hold the purse strings, that want to build bigger and bigger buildings for themselves, that want to hold these big flashy conferences where they have book deals and uh, and musicians that come out with their dyed hair and bleached teeth and fake tans to lead them in singing about how great they are. Sometimes I wonder if that's why there is not more worship of Christ in our nation is because we as a people are so ungenerous in our giving. I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about how ungenerous we are in every facet of worship. Maybe that's some food for thought for us. But their grace, the Philippians' grace to Paul, has renewed him, he says. The word he uses here indicates the language of revival, or to put it in uh, natural terms, in the terms of, uh, of plant life, of flora. The, what is happening here is Paul is reblooming, he's reblossoming. In other words, their gift to him cause his wilted and dry heart to bloom again afresh, like a beautiful new flower, even though it's hidden away in the dank prison cells of Rome. Now think about the witness this bears to maybe other prisoners, to the Roman guards that are watching. In a world that is so selfishly guarding their stuff, not sharing with others. These poor Christians who barely can scrape two pennies together bear witness to a God who is generous himself when he gives to his people all that's needed for life, this life and the next, when they in turn can be generous with one another, trusting in God for their good, trusting in God alone for what they need. Not in their career, not in their state, nothing else but the Lord alone. See, here's the tough fact that we need to think about as people that live in a land of great prosperity. Christians who live in a land of great prosperity. Christians who were not generous to give, to give of their time, their energy, and especially their resources, betray the fact that they don't truly trust in the Lord's provision. If we are not givers, it's because we think it's up to us to provide for our future, not the Lord. We don't trust that God, when he says, who clothes the lily of the field and and gives the, the hole for the fox to sleep in and who cares for the sparrow that's fallen to the ground, We don't trust that God cares even more for his own family, his own image bearers, when we don't give generously, not only to the work of the Lord, but to people, especially Christians in our life in need. What a tragic and scandalous thing. What a rebuke against uh, the evangelicals of this nation that we are not known for our scandalous extravagant generosity. See, what this betrays is that we have contentment really in worldly things, not in the kingdom of Christ, not in the kingdom of heaven coming down to earth where there will be no more need and everybody will have an abundance. We live in a world that could easily provide resources for everyone in it. When God made this world, he made it rich and bountiful so that nobody would go without. But the the sin in our hearts has made it to where we stockpile and we hoard. And when we don't have need, we'll build another silo to put our corn or our grain in and say, and we'll sit back and 
open a bottle of champagne and our soul will be satisfied. But to those people, God says, fool, your soul will be required of you this very evening. It's a danger to live in the world in which we do. As American Christians, I fear for the state of our souls. In some sense, probably per capita, we are, even us as middle class Americans that have bills to pay and debts that we owe, even as us, we probably have more wealth than most of Christians throughout history could ever imagine. We probably do, even, even though things are not easy right now. I understand that. They're not easy for us. They're not easy for me. I get that they're not easy for all of us. But what a scandal it is when we have been given so much, but we think so little of giving to one another. How much of our faith here in America is founded upon the shifting sands of convenience or ease or familiarity? What would happen if everything got stripped away from us tomorrow? That's the apocalyptic vision we always hear on the news and from these, you know, these Christian televangelists. Oh, you better start stockpiling water. Get your rifles loaded because tomorrow the government's going to come and take. Did Paul ever preach to these people that were actually under imperial threat and violence and who could be dragged away by the secret police? He says, well, get your weapons ready because you never know when Rome's going to. Or did he say, pray for the emperor. Give generously even to your enemies. See, we have we show that we love our stuff more than we love Jesus when we live this way. When we live in constant fear that everything's going to be stripped away from us. How much of our faith is founded on those shifting sands and not on the solid rock that is Christ? who is steady in all seasons and circumstances in life, whether we have food or not, whether we have abundance or nothing. See, Paul is quick to clarify here. The gift that he received is a blessing. He appreciates it. It helps him personally. It benefits him. And it bears good witness to Jesus. But Paul does not depend on love offerings or care packages for his life. He depends on Jesus alone. See, verse 11, 12 say this. I don't say this out of need. He's not praising them for giving them this because they're the only people that can supply it. He says, because I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself in. I know how to make do with a little. And I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. The secret of being content, whether he's well fed or hungry, whether in abundance or need. What is the secret, Paul? Now see, let's stop here for a second before we get to that. And the background of the minds of the Philippians. We said this a few weeks ago. There's competing philosophies in their world. One of the beliefs that they would be very familiar with is the ancient Greek philosophy of Stoicism. It's the idea of self-sufficiency, of not relying on others, of trusting in your gut instinct, of having a stiff upper lip in all things. That is a popular lifestyle and philosophy in ancient Rome and Philippi. But Paul is not saying that he's content in himself. He's not saying that he's bearing his suffering uh, for his own honor or dignity. He's saying he is content in Jesus Christ alone. He's saying he's willing to suffer shame and humiliation and torture and impoverishment for the sake of Jesus. See, Paul can rightly and truly say that he can be content in whatever life circumstances because and that he's learned to do with a little or a lot Either is fine, because unlike the Stoics, Paul doesn't believe in being tough just for the sake of being tough, by pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, uh, not of always being proud of oneself and ability to make lemonade when life hands you lemons. Not Paul is not talking about that self-sufficient mentality, that rugged cowboy lifestyle that we're very enamored of here. 
Paul does have needs. He does rely on help from outside of himself. He admits this. And Paul does suffer humiliation. Here's the thing about the Stoics. They could have a tough time, but they would not abide being humiliated or humbled. They won't do that. They won't take charity. They won't take, um, uh, they won't take donations. They would rather suffer and die and keep their honor. Paul's not like that. He suffered, we've read elsewhere, beatings, being stripped naked, shipwrecked. He suffered all kinds of humiliations for the sake of Jesus. But Paul says, this is the difference between stoicism, between rough and tumble American, oh, I'm, I'm self-sufficient. I work for my, I earned everything I got because of my hard work. There's the difference between that and biblical Christianity. Paul is able to bear suffering and scorn and even shame for one reason and one reason alone, as in verse 13 of our Bible passage this morning. Perhaps one of the most famous passages, most famous verses in all the Bible. He says, I am able to do all things through Him, that is Christ, who strengthens me. That is the secret of contentment. That He is able to do anything through Christ who strengthens Him. Now, let's pause here for a minute, minute to say this verse has been taken out of context so wildly, especially in this country. It is taped above bench presses and weight rooms of college athletes. It's been stitched into needle points and hanged on walls of living rooms and and nursing homes where we go to visit grandma. It's been printed onto mugs and tucked into the edge of desks and cubicles of corporate America. It's been featured on t-shirts and billboards and bumper stickers and doormats till it's become a slogan that has lost all of its power and meaning. Everybody in America knows I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everybody knows that phrase. But sadly, it has been so stripped from its historical, from its theological context, and saturated and sentimentalized that it's lost the radical, even scandalous meaning to everyone around us. And worst of all, even us. We don't even know what it means. The way that it's so widely used today is like this. I can do everything, especially cool and exceptional things, anything that I set my mind to, because Jesus Christ gives me the power and authority to do so. It's all about, I. It's, it's, it kind of betrays this prosperity gospel mindset. You know, I'm, you know, look at me. I can do whatever I want to and Jesus will notarize it. I can be a jerk to whoever I want. I can name it and claim it for whatever I want. I can get whatever I want. I can achieve whatever I want because Jesus will pay the bill. It's the preaching of the power of triumphalism with Jesus tacked on as the booster rockets that fall into the ocean once we launch into the stratosphere of success. That's how this verse is seen, especially by evangelicals. Us! But what is the context of Paul saying this? Did he win a spelling bee? Did he get promoted in corporate America? Did he win the Iron Bowl? Did he close on a new house with five bedrooms and three whole baths? Or is Paul saying that no matter how dark the dungeon they throw him in, no matter how tight the shackles are on his wrist, no matter how stale and maggot-eaten the bread he eats is. No matter how dirty the water he drinks. No matter how cruel the guards are to him. No matter how cold the night air without a blanket to cover a shivering body. I can deal with it all through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 is not about how great we are and how God made us that way. 
Philippians 4.13 is about how despite how weak and frail and afraid and poor and pathetic we are, Christ still rules and reigns over our lives. He gives us pure joy and peace when the world takes everything from us. And that's the secret of contentment. Yes, Paul says in verse 14, I am happy you did so well, Philippians, in partnering with me in hardships. In other words, he's grateful that they sent him food and clothes and blankets and soap and books and visitors and love when he was suffering alone. He's thankful for that. He's not a fool. What a joy and comfort and testament to God's love for those who suffer greatly in this world to receive those little material gifts that encourage our hearts. Paul is grateful that they partnered in this hardship with him. He's glad for it. Christians ought to be the kind of people who are deeply generous with those who are suffering for the sake of Jesus. That should just be, that should just be our standard definition. That's not, you know, only the super Christians are generous and loving and caring and self-giving. No, that's just how we ought to all be. But in the end, Paul shows us even more than that, which is a good thing, the secret of being content, the cure to boredom, the panacea to panic, the miracle tonic to fear and discouragement and hopelessness and even death itself is in Jesus and him alone. See, Christ is the strong one who strengthens us in our weakness. Him who hung the stars in the sky is the one who hangs on a cross in our place so that come hell or high water and all things we can make do. We can be content because in Christ we know our future is everlasting life and peace with God and one another. Christian, do you need to learn the secret of being content this morning? I know I do. So when the chemo starts, and when the bills come due, and when the family falls apart, and when the job offer is revoked, and when the pension shrivels, and when the depression creeps back, and when the aches start up again, and when the shame is too much to bear, and when the kids aren't all right, and when the marriage is on its last leg, when the house is too quiet and lonely and not filled up with the people it used to be, when all seems said and done, you can be content in all situations. You can be at peace in all circumstances. You can have joy even in the middle of your heartache. Because through Christ, your strength, your hope, your love, your life, and your joy, you can do all things. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us poor sinners when our hearts long for all the things that can never satisfy us, be the one who is our all in all. Unlock contentment, even joy in us by the power of your spirit. Unclench our fist from the fading things of this world and let us cling to Christ instead who clings to us through it all. And all these things we ask and pray in the precious, powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.